everybody. My name is Brian Kelly, and welcome back to Talk of the Town. We have another great show for you today. And I want you to meet a good friend of mine, Liz and Milton, Steve Shapiro. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. The reason Steve is on the show is because he wants to tell the folks at home about something very special that's going to be happening this summer in Milton. And for you folks who have a student in the uh, in school who would like to have a, um, a companion from a faraway land, join the family for a week or two and get to know and explore another culture. We have something coming up. And what is it called? It's called what? It's the Explore Japan Summer Program at Milton High School and Milton Academy. Explore Japan Summer Program. this this is a no this is no cost to you folks at home i know because we hosted one of the students from explore japan last year and that's why i wanted to do a little segment on this because it was a lot of fun it was a great experience glad to hear that now all you folks need to do is you can send your child to explore japan at the high school or milton academy depending if your child is a boy or a girl and um all the family needs to do is host this uh, exchange, kind of like an exchange student type of a thing, right? Exactly. Is host the student, get to know them, and uh, and uh, that's that's the best part I have to tell you because not only do the kids get to interact or the children get to interact during the day with these with the uh, with the students from Japan, but um, the families get to do a lot of interaction at home and on the weekend, which we found to be precious. <laughs> so. Uh, but uh, it's tell, tell the folks a little bit about it and what they need to do or what they should be aware of to stay informed of what's going on and be able to participate. Sure. In this you you actually des- described it very well, Brian. Uh, our program <laughs> is a combination of an exchange program and a summer enrichment program. And, yes, it is actually a free program that goes for two and a half weeks. I like and, free. Uh, free. Free, free it's, is good. It's a... Students are eligible starting in second grade, so as young as eight-year-olds all the way up to 16-year-olds can participate in the program, and we generally do have people in all of those age groups that participate. And basically what we have is for two and a half weeks, we have some students from Japan come over to visit us in Milton, and they stay with you, the host family, during that time. And each morning, host parents bring both their, their visitor and their own child over to the school, and we have a really fun time in the morning learning different things about each other's culture on campus, and then in the afternoon after we've had lunch, we embark on a field trip together so that we can show these kids around town. Um, This is for all of the Japanese students who are in the program. This is their first time to the Boston area, so it's a real thrill for them to be able to go to Fenway Park and Museum of Fine Arts and the aquarium and Freedom Trail, and Harvard's very uh, popular over there, so it's a real thrill for them. And on top of that, it's a real thrill for the people who host, because it's an opportunity to really learn about another culture that not that many people in America actually know that much about, the Japanese culture. Well, interesting. I mean, a lot of the students in Milton are familiar with the French culture, all obviously because of the French immersion program yes. and the Spanish program. So they're more informed on that. So this is is another um, learning experience because it's something they are pretty ignorant about. How did you um, get involved in uh, Explore Japan? Steve? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I had a roommate in college who was Japanese, and after I had um, graduated from school, he had invited me to come over and visit. 
And what was supposed to um, last, you know, about 10 days turned into about five or six weeks. Don't invite <laughs> Steve to your cottage. <laughs> was having a good time. <laughs> he may never and, leave. Um, really traveled the country and met a lot of his friends and, and made a lot of friends there. And after I returned uh, to the U.S. and was working, I, I started, this was before the Internet and email, I started receiving all these letters saying, hey, I was interested in coming and visiting and I was going to bring my friend and can you help arrange this for me? And and one thing sort of led to another and, and I basically started helping make some arrangements for a group of people and it, it got larger and larger. And, and finally, I, I had a job at the time at, at a bank downtown and I said, you know, this seems like more fun doing this arrangement than working at a bank and basically turned it into a business where I went over there and started calling on schools. And in Japan, it's very institutionalized for schools to run these trips. And these school trips... What do you mean? Trips, is it a common thing for them to run It's trip? quite common for schools, both public and private, to have a two or three week trip during the summer school vacation mm -hmm. um, where their kids can go abroad and stay with host families. Because in Japan, unlike America, in Japan... For, English as the f number one foreign language is sort of a mandatory subject. So it's not like we choose, gee, I don't know if I'm going to take French or Spanish or German or Italian. Whereas in their country, you will take English. And English is the first language that you're going to learn. And everybody begins learning it as early sometimes as third grade. And for them, it's a real important language uh, for obvious reasons. They do a lot of business with the rest of the world. And English really is the language that people use to do business all over the world. So Steve was saying that um, a lot of the uh, students in Japan travel abroad during the summer break, and they all take English. It's almost like a mandatory immersion program. Is that, is that basically what That's it is? That's right. That's right. And um, Although, now, do you think they do a good job of learning English? Because I remember when they came, a lot of them were struggling with the language more than I expected. Yep. It's like, uh, Brian, it's like anything else. Uh, when you take a foreign language, sometimes people really embrace it. Um, to some people it comes naturally, and to others it's more of a struggle, and it's more just like another subject that you're just trying to get through. And in Especially of, when it's mandatory. Exactly. Yeah. And so for a lot of students, <laughs> I think they've studied a lot of classroom English, but as anyone who's gone abroad and tried to speak another language knows, that's far different than going over there and speaking fluently with you know, someone who's a native speaker. So I think what this is for a lot of our Japanese students is this is their wake-up call. Uh, many of them have actually been studying the language for five, six, seven years, and they actually can read and write the language quite well, mm -hmm. but they haven't had a lot of practice with native speakers. So this is sort of a wake-up call to them of saying, I have to work harder on my conversation skills. And some of them come over and, and have decent conversation skills. Other of them even though they know the language quite well, they kind of hold back. And that could be because they're shy. And that sure. could be because they're, it's a little intimidating to them to be with a whole group of people who might be talking really fast. And they're used to dealing with people who speak quite slow. So we do actually give our host families a lot of tips before the kids come over. And, and one of the first things we always say is, you know, speak slowly. It will help in your communication. The girl that stayed at my house was tortured. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Kelly's are a little outgoing. We, we so. don't we don't speak slowly <laughs> <laughs> or softly. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a good time. Well, tell some of the folks. There are some. You know, if you do decide to um, get involved and um, have your your child uh, explore Japan through this program that Steve um, hosts at the uh, Milton High School and Milton Academy. And Milton Academy is for the boys, correct? Yeah, Milton Academy is for the boys and Milton High School is for the girls. You might um, there there are some cultural other cultural differences and what are some of the things that the families can expect uh, 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 tell us a little bit about the learning habits or how they're taught in Japan uh, you know there's talk about individualism in the United States versus more that's right. of a group a team concept so that's right and you as know, Toyota's finding out they're, they're having some challenges with that <laughs> the team concept all the cars are broken <laughs> so so tell us a little bit about yeah, that cultural difference well it's kind of funny because when I first started the program it was the late 80s or early 90s and at that time if some of you older folk may remember we really felt like Japan was becoming this economic power that was going to surpass the United States or own the United States and well, it and didn't, some felt threatened a little bit by that. Yeah, so, they did feel yeah. threatened. It, you know, it didn't actually work out that way. But Japan is still actually the number two economy in the world. Um, there's a lot of talk that China is about to pass it, but for the time being, uh, Japan has the second largest GNP in the world, second largest economy. So the Japanese are still major players, you know, in the world economy. And the Japanese do have a, di a different way of going about things as compared with the United States. And they've seen both success and failure with that. I mean, they're very much people with a group mentality. Um, as so, the, so the students come over and they, they're like, they almost all huddled together. And now, and, That's then, right. and then you torture them by tearing them apart That's from the right. group and so send them to some I, strange man's I house. Have, <laughs> yes. I, I have to forewarn them before they have this experience that I know you're all used to being treated the same in almost everything you do in your life there, but when I'm going to place you at 35 different host families, I'm going to assure you that you're going to have 35 <laughs> very different experiences, all for the good, but very different. <laughs> and we have to really spend a lot of time introducing them to that concept because that's not a concept that They're they've been to. introduced to yet. Now, you've had how many, how many years have you hosted someone at your home? Um, I've probably done it, uh, well, I've had this program for 18 years, and I've probably done it, you know, about half. Half the time, half the time. we've okay. come over. So I've hosted many a kid, many of an adult, and it's it's always been a very interesting and positive experience. And you have families host these children from not just Milton, but from other communities, That's correct? right. People are welcome. Anyone's welcome to participate. I mean, we do have a lot of Milton families because it's convenient and it's in Milton, but we have plenty of people from surrounding towns and even some folks who come from a little far away because their children are so interested in Japanese culture. Now, um, so... What I'm telling you, folks, is if you want to take advantage of this, you want to get involved early because there are only so many children that are coming over, so many slots available for this. So um, how will they um, get in touch with you if they want right. to host so a Right, so there's a couple a of ways. I mean, they can go to our website, and which what is, is the website? AmericanLearning.com. One word, AmericanLearning.com. Uh, you can Google Explore Japan Milton, and our website will come up. And you can sign up right through the website. Or, by all means, call our office uh, at Pinnacle Learning Center in Canton at 781-828-2800. Um, we have 35 slots for the girls' program at Milton High School, and we have 25 slots for the boys' program at Milton Academy. And those slots do fill up through the spring. Um, we just set our dates this week, so we know that so the, what group, are the, dates? the group's uh, coming flying in on July 28th. And basically staying for two and a half weeks and leaving August 14th, which is a Saturday morning. But they don't host for two and a half weeks, do they? Yeah, you host for, for two, two and a half, half weeks. Do, okay. Yep. Well, yep. Did we do that a long time? Yeah, you did. Okay. You did. And um, yeah, we had a girl named Haruka. I, remember, I think that was her name. Lovely, Haruka. charming young lady. What was her girlfriend's name? <laughs> there was another girl that came over and visited with us. Uh, was it Mio? No. Or uh, was it uh, uh. Yumi? No. Okay. Name, oh, well, I, I apologize by that. But we went camping one weekend. We, we had that was an introduction to American culture. <laughs> and my crazy neighbor came with us with his family and we, flipping the pancakes. And he, 
throw them up in the air. You had to catch them on the plate. Oh, they thought we were crazy. I think they'll never forget they'll that never experience. Forget that. But um, I know some families uh, took uh, their guests to New York City. Yeah, uh, people uh, went all over the place. And, you know, we always tell people, by all means, do whatever you would regularly do on weekends. We went to Canopy Lake Park. Yeah, weekend you know, is so. free time. Families can do whatever they want. We encourage you, if you want to get together with other families who also have a student, um, you know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, this program was started to really bring two cultures together and help each culture learn about each other. But one of the nicest side effects of the program is I find that a lot of the host families hadn't known each other prior to the program and had become good friends through the program because they shared the common experience or their children were both interested in Japanese culture. And a lot of people have always said, well, it was great experience for me, but I really loved the opportunity to meet this family from Brain tree that I didn't know before, this family from Canton, you know. Well, we got to know you better because That's of right. It. That's right. And uh, going to take the kids down to uh, Nantasket Beach and things. <laughs> <laughs> so it was good. It was a lot of fun. And uh, I think uh, I highly recommend it. And I like the fact that it's free. You know, you, yes, you're going to have to spend a little money on paying for an extra person to feed. Big deal. Matter of fact, our host, uh, our, our guest cooked dinner for us one night <laughs> and I made a Japanese meal and everything and, and so didn't she mow the lawn once for you Brian or I'm come on keep it down I, you know <laughs> you told me you weren't going to say anything <laughs> I didn't make her wash the windows no <laughs> but we we had a lot of fun and um and they had a lot of fun. That's good. And I would like to just talk a little about the whole hosting experience because the most common question that we get at our, our office by people who are interested is, you know, gee, can I host or what's your criteria for who can be a host family? And really, it's quite easy and it's quite simple. And I always tell people the same thing. I qualify. We, we're we just looking for people who are nice people and interested in this experience. Everything else will work itself out. We don't have any requirements about what kind of house you live in, what kind of people you are, as long as you're nice. And we've had that policy for 18 years, and that's always worked out so well. And it's part of the reason the program has had so much longevity, is we've had such great host families that are just doing it for the right reasons, which are we want to learn about a new culture, we want to welcome a guest into our home, we want to introduce our children to this person from the other side of the planet. Mm -hmm. And so hosting is quite easy. People often ask us, oh, do they have to have their own bedroom? And most host families actually have the student bunk with their child of so you know, did, the same we gender. Did, uh, Morgan, uh, we did also. Morgan and and um, people who have an extra guest room usually give the Japanese student the option. Would you like your own room? Would you like to bunk with you know, your host sister? And in most cases, they want to bunk with the host sister because they like that camaraderie, and that's part of the experience. So the requirements for hosting are really not what a lot of people think. It's just that you're nice people, and you're going to be accommodating to drive them each morning with your child to the, to the program and give them three meals a day and just... Let them be part of the family. That's the main thing we want. They, they don't care about being indulged. What they really want is just to feel like they're part of your family. And it was it was it was worth it. It was a great experience, and we had a lot of laughs, especially with food issues, you know, and and uh, taking out different things and having her try the different things and giving her a little bit of something and she'd try it. And she'd say, nah, and then try something else, and she liked it. And to, to, to explore, just to, we were exploring Japan, literally like the name impl implies here, you know, every day. Every, every moment was an, an exploration, you know, of um, their culture and their learning our culture. And it was, it was well worth it, folks. So I highly recommend it. And uh, so please make sure you uh, contact Steve and, uh, and – uh, I think you'll be glad that you did because I know uh, I was a little nervous about it, you know, and, uh, and we, we were glad we did. Great. And we, and we made new friends. Got a nice letter from uh, the young woman that stayed with us and, that, and got a nice letter from her parents, you know, thanking us for it, and, which we thought was very nice. So, uh, And then, you know, we go on to Google and you go on to the Internet and you see the school that they went, that they attend. And they spent they spent nice. a longer time in school than uh, the American students. They, oh. they don't have a, a oh, long yeah. summer break. Do oh, they? yeah. There's, there's a big difference uh, there. So, Steve, there's a, there's a big difference between the educational system in Japan versus here in the States, is there not? Yeah, there really is, Brian, and uh, it's something that I do 
like to talk to people about in this country because I also my profession is I'm an educator and uh, you know I've been over to Japan so much and spent so many so many days in Japanese schools and and my wife is a teacher in Milton Public Schools and you know I I, I get a chance to sort of compare and contrast education in that country and education in this country and it's it's. It is kind of sobering uh, when you think about not just Japan, but all the East Asian countries like South Korea, Taiwan, and certain parts of mainland China now, and just the rigor of the academics in their K-12 through school system. And when I say the rigor, uh, I'm talking about also just the quantity of time that students spend at school. And I'm sure that there's, there's arguments both ways about having a longer school year or having a longer school day. Uh, here in the U.S., they're starting to experiment with longer school days in some urban districts. But mm -hmm. in Japan, they go 240 days. Um, How many days here? We go 180 here. So if you think about that, you can think about it in this term. They go 60 more days than us a year for 12 years. Okay, so that's 720 extra days. So it's really the equivalent of three to four um, extra years, years. Of, of of schooling. And that's not even counting the fact that they have a longer day um, and certainly pile on the homework more. And, you know, there there may be a point where maybe maybe that's too much and maybe there's a happy medium between the number of days that we go and the number of days that they go. And I've never totally been convinced that their system is so superior to ours, to be honest with you, because... As a lot of people know, one thing that Americans excel at um, that the rest of the world really can't keep up with us is we, we're creative. And part of that creativity has to come from something we're doing here in the education system. And the other countries uh, recognize that, that we still are the inventors of the world. And why is that? And what is it about our system that creates so many inventors? Um, whereas their system creates, it seems like, a lot of very academically rigorous and successful students who can go on to, you know, do meaningful, have meaningful careers, but not quite be the Steve Jobs type of person um, and so on and so forth. So there, there are differences. Theirs is longer, more rigorous, more homework. Ours and, still and you really are, haven't seen the evidence that I, they're that much smarter as far as... It's that that's a, a tough question that right. would take me many days to dissect, but we don't say, have that long. <laughs> <laughs> but to say, I think there are things we can learn from the rigor that they do, especially in the elementary level. Um, I think learn? especially in math and science. So I would say the way that they're doing math and science clearly seems superior to the way we do math and science and especially in math where they're really still doing a lot of the old school, really drilling, drilling, drilling students in the fundamentals so much in first, second, and third, and fourth grade before they move on to higher level math. And their students seem to have more of a math proficiency at an earlier age. So they're able to take on more rigorous math at an earlier age. Um, so that, and that do, is and one do, thing. And do they take on more rigorous? Math? Yes, they definitely do. Well, Steve knows this. His wife's a math teacher, so <laughs> have, has she looked at some of the stuff that they yeah, do? And yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, it's not uh, uncommon in Japan for an eighth grader to be taking, you know, algebra two, mm -hmm. and uh, or already have taken it by seventh grade. So that's a year or two earlier than yes. we do it anywhere in the United States, mm -hmm. even including private schools. So. And they're talking about trying to improve, you know, science and math. In yep. this country, yep. so obviously, and I think improvements are coming in this country mm -hmm. also, and I just think there's a lot we can learn from them, and there's a lot they can learn from us about the whole creative factor. But that also mm -hmm. doesn't just have to do with the education system, but that has to do with our culture. We happen to be a more creative culture that believes in individuality, and that's something that's been going on here for many centuries. Whereas they, for uh, you know, about four or five thousand years, they're a very old culture. <laughs> have believed in the group dynamic, and it's, it's worked well for them. They might claim that it works better because they've lasted longer, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet, do we? We get started <laughs> a lot later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, hey, you know, that brings about, you know, you talk about education, and uh, we were having a conversation earlier. We're talking about, let's, folks, 
Steve does some other things besides explore Japan. So that's just part of what you do, right? Yes, that's part now, of what I, I do. Slide, uh, slide apart from this. I also, this, this is was a tutoring, a clinical learning center. That's right. Not, so this not is not where we are right? over in Canton right now. <laughs> we're at his, um, in the village is, shops in Cobb's, Cobb's Corner. Corner. Behind and the Shaws. Behind the Shaws. You will find us tucked away, and we've been here for nine years now. And we're in the business of helping any student, uh, K through 12 and beyond, um, get better in school. And uh, that could be the person who's the valedictorian that just needs a little help in, you know, AP physics, or it could be the person who got straight C's and their parents, you know, are throwing their hands up and saying, gee, I don't know what I could do to get this person up to the B level, or all the way in between. So any type of student, our whole process is individualized. So we, we look at you and only you, and we, we diagnose your strengths and weaknesses. And then sometimes those weaknesses are just something that you didn't master from last year that we need to sort of remind you of and get you back up to speed. Because, uh, you know, in certain subjects like math, math is cumulative, and uh, it's hard to succeed in eighth, eighth grade math if a few times in seventh grade, you really didn't get it. And so sometimes you have to step back a little, make sure you mastered that seventh grade um, topic before you, go get before lost you can move for forward. Going, yeah. yeah, and that actually is the same in most subjects. Well, uh, you know, we we're talking about universities and going to school and everything, and, and I think you asked me earlier, you said, Brian, if, if I had to qualify for my university, where I went to school up in Nova Scotia, St. Francis Xavier University up in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Excellent school. And you said, Excellent if I had school. to qualify to get in there, do you think I would qualify and you said you asked this question to a lot of adults today and most of them believe that they probably wouldn't qualify based on how they qualify when they were entering university and the point was that schools have become more competitive there's no doubt about it i mean part of it is a population bubble currently mm -hmm. and uh, i feel most sorry for the um, class that graduated last year and the year before because apparently they were the real peak of the population bubble and mm -hmm. it's it's going slightly down right now but the fact is is that when people in our age category, sort of on the tail end of the baby boom, we, when we were applying to college, uh, there were many less applicants, and there are, there are three so to we four times as many applicants They let now. us in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now they let you in. I see Cornell <laughs> University up here. You know anything about Cornell? Yeah, it's pretty prominently featured around this learning center, <laughs> and I uh, have uh, actually a couple of degrees from there. And, uh, you know, I would say the same thing as... One uh, wasn't enough, huh? Huh? Yeah, one wasn't <laughs> enough. Uh, but I would say the same thing uh, that you just said, which is anyone I know, no matter where they went to college, um, who are our age, uh, you know, if I said to them, with the grades that you had and the SAT scores and all the other things that you had, could you get in there today? And most people would honestly tell you, I don't think I could get in there today. And if they said they could get in there, they're probably lying um, because it is that much more competitive. So it's that much more important nowadays, unfortunately, for our children who are matriculated. Fortunately for you who <laughs> provide tutoring services. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's much more competitive and having good grades and good SAT scores and good other things you can put uh, like community service and part-time jobs and activities and sports are more important than ever. Now, we, we were using an example, say, Cornell, and you had heard a statistic about uh, right now at Cornell University, they have about 40, say, how many applicants for... Well, I was using Brown University as oh, an example because my dad is uh, working there part-time in admissions, and okay. they um, have about, I think, 1,400, 1,400 slots each year for the freshman class, and this year they got 30,000 applicants. And so if you think about that, you think, what are the odds of getting in? But the crazier part of the story is, is that my dad said of those 30,000 applicants, probably about 29,000 of them have good enough grades, good enough SATs, good enough everything to come in there and be a dean's list student at Brown. So that makes their job even more difficult. How do we um, choose who these lucky 1,400 are? And that's the same story across uh, the Ivy League and the other top colleges across the country. And that's trickled down to almost all colleges, to be honest with you, are more selective than they used to be. And it's, it's more difficult than it used to be. And you mentioned something else that a lot of people forget, that universities are in business. They are in business. It's a business. And if they bring in some top talent and that top talent goes out and does something remarkable in this world, there's a, uh, there's a possibility that... Uh, to pause. I'll wait for him to finish. 
So when people forget that these universities are businesses, and of course they want to be selective if they can, and obviously if there's a lot of applicants, they can be more selective. It's just the way it is. And so by being more selective, they can uh, hopefully pick the, the cream of the crop. Right, like I said, the next Steve Jobs can go there, or the Google guys. and The uh, Google guys, right. I, I can't imagine what kind of check they write to Stanford, but, you know, they really invented it while they were still grad students there, and I, I can't imagine, they seem like pretty nice guys, That uh, how much that's paid off for Stanford. Well, I have a friend, another friend in town, that his full-time profession is a fundraiser for one of the, you know, one of the schools in Boston, and he travels around the world visiting with alumni from that school. And they write checks. I mean, big checks. Okay? And so, if you're, if you're a university and you have someone that's um, just getting by, C average, B's and C's, you know, if they're just going to get by and don't have a strong a, a work ethic or, or something really unique about them, then why do they even want to let them in? Because the chances of them coming back and writing a check for a few million dollars to help fund the endowment at that university are probably pretty slim. (laughs) Now, I know there's that Bill Gates out there who, who... it was a diamond in the rough, in a sense. Sure, right? but he, he was at Harvard, and he could have stayed there and matriculated. He chose not to. He was but smart enough to get in. There are, of course, <laughs> many examples of people who have been successful without ever going to college or uh, not going to the top colleges. I mean, Warren Buffett's a perfect example. And there's a long list of people who have been extremely successful. And I'd be the first to say um, going to college isn't everything. But I do think in this day and age and in this current economy, Uh, Going to the best school you possibly can go is a very good insurance policy for having a good career. Um, With that said, it doesn't mean it's the end of your life. There's still people with good work ethic, people with good habits and good personalities that are needed out there and will thrive and be great successes. So I just wanted to put that disclaimer in because I'm a firm believer in that also. But the other side of it is too, just as well as the universities and colleges are in business, so aren't businesses. And so right now, as you look around, there's a lot of people out of work. So a company, when they're, they're receiving thousands of applications. Now, obviously, there's some industries that still are trying to, hard to find that perfect candidate. And, um, and there's not a large pool of them. But for most industries today, there are a ton of people that are out of work. It's a good thing you got out of the banking business because chances are if you had stayed in the banking business, you'd be out of work right now. Yeah, I mean, no doubt about it. I'd with have been the, the meltdown first, in the financial uh, service industry. I'd have been the first one they cut. <laughs> so, so now companies can be more selective. So who are they going to pick? Are they going to pick someone that just got through, even just got through university? They want the top. It's true. Because they want to make it. They want someone that's going to come up with some solution for one of their issues to help them become great. That's right. Because it's all about money. That's I mean, right. we'd like to think it isn't, but it has a, it's a major indicator or a major factor. That's and, right. And and so I encourage so. students to do the best you can in school. And that's the most important thing. And then stay busy outside of school and doing as many things in your community, charity work, community service work, get a job, whatever kind of part-time job you can get, and participate in the types of clubs and activities. And activities like our summer program, Explore Japan, where, you know, it's a conversation starter. Um, We have many students who have been in Explore Japan, who've gone on to actually um, major in international relations in college or study Japanese in college. And a lot of them have called us or emailed us and say, hey, in my interview for college, I talked about Explore Japan. And I could tell that the admissions officer really was like, whoa, I haven't heard this before. So the admissions officer was a three-month program, and <laughs> yeah, they attended it every year. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's no problem, but the admissions officer said, hey, wow, that's kind of interesting. I wouldn't have expected you to have done something like that, or that's a really neat thing that you've done, and it gives you a different perspective. And that perspective is so important for young people today. And I know you hear this uh, term all the time that the world is flatter and we're more connected, and it's, it's totally true thanks to the Internet and all technology. But the most important thing is, is understanding other cultures and having some sensitivity towards other cultures and some understanding of other cultures. And whether it's Japan or Africa or Australia or France, it, or it Afghanistan. doesn't Afghanistan. It's all about it doesn't matter. It's all about understanding. And being less and, ignorant. And I, I do make the speech at our farewell party every year at the program and say – 
to the host families, you have just done the most wonderful thing. And if more people participated in this type of program, we would have no war on this planet. And that's not some idealistic statement that I'm making, but I would love to someday do this with Afghanistan people, Iraqi people, wherever. Because when people meet people, this program has showed me when people meet people, they learn about each other and find their common ground and end up usually liking each other. Sure. And that leaves a lasting impression. Right. So you know the real people, not just something you see on the news or you see in the media. Sure. People who need people <laughs> are the lucky... No, you know what I'm saying, Steve? <laughs> Hey, I told him you never know what's going to happen here. That's what I heard. Talk of the top. I, I, I heard that about your show, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, you've wasted another perfect 45 minutes of your life. No, just kidding. You. That's from Click and Clack. Ever hear Click and Clack? Yeah. <laughs> they are funny. But uh, listen, uh, I, I appreciate you tuning in. And uh, Steve, uh, another member of the Milton community, Steve Shapiro, who's over here in Canton at the uh, Pinnacle Learning. Was it Pinnacle Learning Center? Um, you know, he's trying to help people improve their lives. And I, Can I also just oh, show oh, a oh, wait a minute. Here we go. I'm not, I'm not I think stepping on your show. I think he's Superman. I What's just want you to know that by participating in the program, you get the nice Explore Japan t-shirt and um, one of the many fringe benefits of participating in this free program. What a country, hey? You <laughs> thought nothing was free. You said there was no free lunch. Well, the hey. Milton family that had a uh, Japan uh, exchange student and um, with the Sadoti family. Is Charles? Yes. And Sophia. And what's your name? Isabella. Isabella. Olivia. Olivia. And this is Anna. Anna Lamb. Anna Lamb. And uh, who is your uh, exchange student? Subasa. Subasa. Say hello, Subasa. Hello. And who is this? Sihori. Look at the camera. Sihori. <laughs> and uh, tell us about your experience with your exchange student. It was wonderful. We think uh, it's an experience that my daughter and hopefully Subasa and Shihori will remember and be telling their kids someday, I'm sure. So, so you think people should take advantage of this opportunity? Oh, absolutely. 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 And hopefully one day, Olivia and maybe Anna can go to Japan and visit Japan as well. Did you enjoy your guest? Yes. Did you learn anything from your guest? Uh, yes. How about yourself? Yeah. She, they made us dinner one night, and so that was an experience. <laughs> was it a good experience? Yeah, it was different. It was different. Delicious. And what's your name? Miku. And what's your name? Natsuki. Natsuki? Yeah. I know Natsuki. She went camping with us last weekend. Did you like camping? Uh, I like uh, camp. You camping. You like camping? <laughs> so uh, thank you for uh, participating. Do it again? Absolutely. Maybe for her. You going to do it maybe? Excellent. Are you starting school next year? First grade? And what are you going to do in the first grade? Learn French. You're going to learn some French? Okay, we'll look forward to seeing you in first grade. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.
talk to Steve. You get involved with Explore Japan. I know we did. I know we enjoyed it. I appreciate you bringing it to Milton. I appreciate you bringing those students from Japan to Milton and uh, making the world a better place for everyone. Thank you again, Steve. Thank you Thank for being you, on Brian. Talk of the Town. My pleasure. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, folks, for watching. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.